Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we break down some of the latest uh, poultry nutrition research for you in under uh, less than 10 minutes. Uh, I'm one of your co-hosts, Sam Rochel, and today I'm joined by a good friend and colleague, Dr. Wilmer Pacheco. Hey, Wilmer, how's it going? Doing good, Sam. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, You bet. Good to talk with you. Uh, We're lucky that we get to interact and work together a lot um, and being in the same department. So it's a a lot of fun to be able to to record this uh, with you. And and you obviously host your own uh, podcast uh, 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 around feed milling, but we'll get the opportunity to hear a little bit about what your lab is is doing. But uh, for those that that may not know you as well, can you introduce yourself a little bit? And then we'll jump into uh, some of the work that you're doing right now. Yeah, um, well, Wilbur Pacheco, I'm originally from Honduras, and I uh, obtained a Bachelor in Science uh, from the Pan American School of Agriculture. Uh, Then I I came to the U.S. in 2006 to work with uh, Smith Field Foods in uh, North Carolina. I worked with them for three and a half years, and then I went to uh, North Carolina State University, where I got my uh, Master in uh, Poultry Science and my PhD in uh, nutrition and physiology. And uh, since March 2015, I am in uh, at Auburn University as an uh, extension specialist and uh, associate professor. And my team uh, basically works on uh, looking at the different uh, interrelationships between uh, feed processing and nutrition and their effect on um, animal performance. The 2023 Arkansas Nutrition Conference Technical Symposium is brought to you by Kerry. Proven on the farm, trusted on the plate. Let our technologies help make your production goals a reality. Learn from the experts how carbohydrates improve nutrient utilization. Gut health technologies differ by type. Innovative ways to feed and a novel technology that will light your performance on fire. See us August 29th in Little Rock. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really good to work with your group. Uh, you have a good team. How many students do you have right now? I have uh, two PhDs, uh, two master's students, and then uh, nine uh, visiting, uh, sorry, five visiting scholars. So nine, nine in total. Yeah. Yeah. A good team for sure. Yeah. So uh, tell us about uh, some of the stuff that, that uh, that group has been working on. I know you've, you've been playing with a new method for determining uh, particle size. We're hearing a lot these days about uh, macro structure and micro structure of pellets, but sometimes that can be tricky. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing in that area? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like uh, about three years ago, um, I just started thinking about like the need to develop a new methodology to evaluate, uh, the particle size in the microstructure or microstructure of the pellets, because, uh, historically we have been focused only like on, on the particle size of uh, a specific ingredient. So. When I was at NC State, I did some research looking the effect of the particle size of soybean meal and corn on um, uh, broiler performance and then organ development. But then, um, you know, as I thought more about like particle size, then I just start realizing, and it's obvious that once that we get these ingredients and then we mix them with the other ingredients in the diet, then the particle size of the meal changes after mixing. And then when this meal goes through the pelleting process, there is some additional grinding uh, that occurs in the pelleting process. So we don't really know what are we offering to the, to the chicks. And um, in Europe, they, they do like a wet sieving uh, to evaluate the particle size in the microstructure of the pellets. However, uh, it is not common to do it here in the, in the U.S. So we, we, we basically went ahead and um, developed um, a methodology uh, to to evaluate the the particle size in the microstructure. Uh, the methodology is fairly simple. Some uh, basically we get a whole pellets, and then uh, we dissolve the whole pellets in a warm water uh, with um, you know forty five Celsius degrees. Uh, this is what will occur at the crop of the of the chick right um, after they consume the pellets. And then the challenge was uh, how we dry uh, those particles without they agglomerating together again. So I was looking how they evaluate like uh, soil density and uh, they, they use a compound that helps for the clades 
to a stay on solution and then they don't agglomerate. So we use uh, exactly the same compound in our method. And then basically with a funnel that has a grit uh, with 40 microns, we can remove the excess of water without losing sample. And then we are gonna get, you know, like um, uh, samples that are, we remove the excess of water, but the, the, the particles are still like uh, moist. Uh, so we place those particles in an acrylic tube and then we inject uh, air. Um, a year ago, we were just injecting ambient air, but now we just uh, warm the air uh, using a serpentine. Uh, so we can uh, dry the sample uh, fairly quick. Uh, we can dry the sample uh, in uh, 25 minutes. And after we dry those, that sample, then we can uh, analyze particle size using the standard methodology. So it, uh, it has allowed us to um, to look the degree of grinding that occurs in um, in the pelleting system. Yeah, really neat. So as far as just the logistics and the setup on the the method, um, you know, you just need compressed air, and I guess the serpentine just helps speed the process. So maybe not necessary. And then the uh, material that you use to to prevent the agglomeration. What is that? Something that's readily available. Yeah, that's uh, sodium hexametaphosphate. Uh, is um, is it's easy to buy online. And uh, one of the things that we did when we were developing this methodology, we were um, um, trying to avoid using, you know, um, chemicals um, uh, for the methodology. Just that way, it's safe for everybody to 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 do. Um, yeah, like I I can give you like an example. You know, when uh, we were dissolving the samples. Uh, we try with um you know uh like 10 percent of uh formaldehyde and it will help to um dissolve the sample quicker but i mean uh, that could have some restrictions in other countries so we just decided to use warm water mm -hmm. yeah so how long does it take generally uh for a normal feed sample um how long does it take to to do the whole process um i guess uh, the the sieving is similar so just the sample prep, how long does that generally take? Well, you know, it will take between one hour and a half and two hours uh, to do the whole the whole process. But the nice thing is like uh, you can be running uh, samples. Um, you don't have to wait to finish one sample to start the other one. So you could be drying one sample while you are removing the excess of water for for the other sample. So um, it's, it's fairly quick. Um, yeah, and uh, a little bit of that too, some that I think is important to share is the idea is to create a prediction equation. So uh, we, we collect some samples from feed mills and um, just from commercial feed mills. And the idea is just look different particle sizes and uh, hopefully in the future we can create a prediction equation that will tell you if the original uh, mass particle size is this and then we got like a, a a pellet die with a uh, X, you know, diameter and compression ratio, and then we could predict uh, what will be the the average particle size inside the pellets. But uh, what we have seen right now is that if you have in the mash an average particle size of 950 microns, in the pellet is going to be about 600 microns. So there is there is a reduction of uh, 300 to 350 microns just in the in the pelleting process. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. And honestly, that was something I had not until talking with you, you know, and, and, and when Dr. Spheus was here, I had really thought a lot about that extent. You know, certainly if you add whole wheat to the mixer or something, you expect some grinding, but I never really realized that there was that much grinding for mash feeds during the pelleting process. So I think that's probably eye-opening for a lot of people, maybe. Yeah, there is a lot of grinding, and I think the risk is that sometimes, you know, like the industry, you know, when it's particularly when they are producing commercial feeds and then feed for their own integration, they can grind uh, too fine. And then they could be, instead of being like 950, they could be like at 750. Uh, and then once that, that goes through the, through the pelleting system, there is not uh, any like um, coarse material inside the pellets to stimulate uh, gizzard function and reverse peristalsis. Um, what I typically tell, you know, you know, the, the companies is you should go to the field and then start looking that gizzard and that proventriculus. And uh, if, if you look like uh, a gizzard that is as big as the proventriculus or you are seeing some proventriculitis on the field, 
that will be an indication that uh, you are grinding the, the, the material to find uh, for, for birds. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. So how far do you think you are from uh, the prediction equations? I mean, are you just building the database to get, get more um, data points or, or what's the status there? So basically we, to, to have like a good prediction equation, I need two things. One is like, uh, you know, uh, a grad student uh, willing to continue the work. Right now I don't have a, a grad student dedicated to, to continue the work. So I will rel rely on my uh, visiting scholars. And then I need, you know, um, you know, feed meals uh, to send me, you know, like um, a samples. And um, so, you know, anyone that is listening to this podcast and uh, is willing to know what is the particle size in the microstructure in the microstructure of those pellets, uh, they can send me an email, and uh, I will be happy to coordinate, uh, you know, the shipping of the samples and share the results with them. With science-led solutions that are sustainable, proven, and effective, BASF helps you tackle the challenges of poultry nutrition. We offer high-quality feed ingredients that enable a more sustainable production and help you achieve your animal performance targets. We call it the science of sustainable feed that succeeds. Well, I appreciate that. Well, we won't uh, keep you much longer. I know you're about to go place some chicks for a, a trial at the farm, so the team's probably, probably waiting on you. But but thanks again, Wilmer. Great talking with you, and uh, thanks for for sharing and, and being willing to share it. And again, if anyone heard, uh, if if you have samples that you would like to have analyzed, uh, please reach out, and, and Dr. Pacheco will assist with that. Thank you, Sam. Uh, it's it's nice talking to you. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.